a lot of Sundays left this year. <laughs> How was that? Uh, made a pretty big earmark uh, this, this month. I've been here 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. I must admit, you know, the, the planes were pretty intimidating at first when I got here. When I, I grew up in a place barricaded by a lot of horizontal trees and mountains and stuff, so I, I, you know, they, they, they hear there, you get claustrophobic in places. Well, there's a reverse claustrophobic when you get out and, and you see everything that, that happens. And uh, so the longest open fields I had back then were, were, you know, not more, much more than a quarter mile, you know, unless I got out on the ocean. And I didn't like the ocean because I always got seasick out, out there. So, um, <laughs> so I, I didn't get seasick out here, but it, it, was, it was intimidating. But uh, I often ran on, on logging roads back there and on rivers and wind up out in the mountains through the trees. And now here I walk out and go out in the plains and, okay. I can see where I need to go pretty, pretty easily. Um, but uh, I was, uh, I, all my life I, 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 raised, I was raised on a dairy. I was, and uh, after I was married, Kat and I owned a, uh, a heifer ranch. And uh, that followed the same familiar occupation. Life was ordinary. It was secure, predictable over there in Washington where I grew up. The reverse is true for others. You know, I remember visiting with my pastor uh, in these dark alleyways, and I remember his comments. And he says, you know, these, the, the houses were surrounded by these big, huge, monstrous trees. And he made this comments, how do people live like this? Because he grew up in, in the desert with the wide open spaces. And he'd, he'd been there for about 20 years, uh, when, I, when I left, and, and uh, he since retired, and there was a pastor there for about uh, two years, and then that pastor left. Now there are churches without a pastor, and he's still at that pastor, at that church, but he's not the pastor of the church. He's an elder, but, but he preaches every other Sunday with another elder, so he's still there about, uh, about 40 years, 40 years at the same church. I've been, so in a sense, I've been set free from the confines of finite spaces in Washington State to a place with infinite horizons. It's, it's, uh, it's nice. Much like that, when a person trusts in Christ, many times the freedom Christ gives can be a type of reverse claustrophobia. A part of us wants to be imprisoned, and a part of us wants to be free. One of the reasons Islam and the Palestinians and Hamas is gaining young followers is that there are rules to follow. There's an imprisonment in their doctrines. Another one is that they don't have a clue. Um, with Islam, a.k.a. Hamas, there's a system of security and sanctuary in bondage. People oftentimes would rather serve a devil they know than a redeemer they don't understand. That's why some prisoners return to prison. Battered women return to their abusers and sinners return to wallowing in their sin. The chains of slavery can become like toys that we can control. At least, at least it's familiar. At least I know the outcome of this. The same old security, the childish ways. The bars and the cells of unforgiveness and, and the clanging steel of vengeance can soothe or drown out the painful truth of slavery, the painful truth of hurt, the painful truth of our own sin. Please, let's turn to Acts 4, 23. The journey of faith starts out with a call to freedom. You know, go to a land that I will show you. Right off the start, Abraham, I'm calling you from the Ur of the Chaldees, from your family, all of you, and I'm calling you to a land, a promised land. It's going to be good. And so Abraham goes, believe in Jesus and you'll have eternal life. You know, Jesus is preparing a place for us. 
across the Red Sea through the wilderness to a promised land. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know, God always calls people to a place of freedom. But in our freedom we have in Christ, do we ever murmur like those, (laughs) God, what are you doing now? God, it was, my life was a little bit, I'm not going to say better, but predictable, uh, safer, I don't know, before I started following you. Now, Now, I don't know what's going on. Why have you brought me into this desert? It would have been better to die as slaves in Egypt to where the leeks and the onions, where we could count on the regular day of making bricks and building cities for the Egyptians, where we had the familiar odor of sweat and and the common aches and pains of life. You know, that was a life that we could predict. You know, there's 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 a life of worldly stability. With God, who knows what will happen around the next corner. Day 21. Is it day 21? Yeah, day 21, star date 2024. Is a life lived for God unpredictable? Does does it have a feeling of uncertainty? You know, life with Jesus is uncharted territory and completely different than the security of the flesh. But God has a light and the gift of the Holy Spirit to boldly lead us to go where no man has gone before. You know, last, last time we observed that Peter and John were thrown in jail, and they, 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 they faced the temple guards, the Sadducees, and the chief priests' of family. They were questioned. They were threatened and released. You know, this, this was the, the experience they had. Whoa, we're following Jesus. They're, they're freedom in Christ, and they're thrown into jail. But, but their new freedom was not defined by these circumstances. In Acts 4, starting with verse 23, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God, Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against the anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, and the the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. You know, the first thing Peter and John might have done if they were relying on their old worldly ways was either either to uh, to to cower in, in 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 secret or lock themselves behind closed doors, or or maybe they said, "Hey." We just gained 5,000 followers. Maybe, maybe we can take these 5,000 followers and gain more 5,000. This is exploding. We're going to overtake these Jews and we're going to become the new religion. We're going to... But that's not what they did. They didn't go and go against those power-hungry leaders the way those power-hungry leaders wanted to run over them. 
You know, they crucified Jesus. Now they were threatening to punish Peter and John for demonstrating that Jesus was alive with miracles and signs of truth. Peter and John were on to something. But it wasn't the same religious way that was attacking and that crucified Jesus. Peter and John had been freed from the system of the flesh long enough to know that it was bondage, especially in the religious context. Jesus did not work in the confines of earthly wisdom or power. Jesus worked with the unlimited power of love. You know, when I looked out on these planes, I don't see any boundaries. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a fence over there, but a few roads, but it's just wide open. I just see this. And when God frees a person, he is free indeed. And God releases the chains of slavery and opens up the door that once barred us and barred him within the confines of the flesh and and the worldly circumstances. This person is now free to operate in the limitless love and the power of God, and it scares the bejeevers out of most of us. Love, forgiveness, peace, you know, God, God has placed some landmarks out there to keep his way in perspective. You know, as we look at Peter and John's reaction, I hope the landmarks of their journey can lead us through the freedom we have in Christ Jesus. When Kat and I were returning home from Sterling uh, a few years back during a blizzard on a Christmas night, we depended on the landmarks to get us home. I, I remember it was, it was so blizzardy and stuff. I, I, I got motion sickness in, in, in that because I couldn't see anything. In fact, I had to open the door a few times. We were just going really slow down the road uh, from Akron to, to here. And I had to open the door just to see. I could, we couldn't see lines or anything, but I had to see the grass on the side of the road. Okay, we're still on the road. We're still headed, headed home. It was, it was the landmarks. And... Uh, So most of the time, I I didn't even know how far we had come or how much longer. It took a long time. (laughs) I mean, it might have took two hours to get from Akron to here. Now, now that's, that's, give it, it's it's 30 miles, okay? Now, if if you're in Florida and Orlando and you're trying to go five miles, it might take two hours, but that's not because of the bad blizzards. (laughs) That's just bad traffic. But, But we... You know, it was, it was, it was crazy. And, and then it was, it was as, as we finally pulled into the driveway, I think I got stuck right there. I had to dig myself into the driveway. And then, and then we finally laid in bed at about 4 o'clock in the morning. It was all worth it. We made our way home through the landmarks. And, and you know, when I was uh, in Florida and I was listening to all the, everybody saying, we got to close the church down. This is exactly what I thought was happening here when I was in Florida, you know. <laughs> Blizzards and, and all that stuff. You know, you poor people. Um, you had to close the church. But, uh, but when I refer, okay, back to Acts 4, I'm going to go there often, but please bookmark this and, and you can turn to Romans 15. Landmarks are vital to the Christian journey. You know, the first landmark I want to observe from Peter and John is that they made a report. They reported. They exposed something. You know, sometimes we like to keep our battle secret. Okay? I'm going through a battle. You're going through a battle. And we go, ah, I don't want anybody to know how weak I am. You know, and, and, you know, I, I just... We, 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 we come to church and, and we put on our best clothes, right? And there's a, there's a song out there that says uh, masquerade. There's a, there, there's a masquerade that we have. That's not what church is about. When Peter and John came back from talking to these Sadducees and, and, and the chief priests, and, and they, they, didn't, they didn't go and say, okay, uh, 
Everything's all right. God's good. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. You know, they, they basically made a report and said, this is what happened. This is what we were up against. And, to, and, and we are all up against something. And that's why I kind of like our, our men's breakfast, because a lot of times we'll just say, hey, you know, this is the way it is. And uh, we, 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 we share each other's burdens and our struggles, and we pray for each other. And, and that's what we do in the church, too, I hope. We're not just a bunch of stained glass masquerades here. We make a report. We expose our weaknesses. We expose our sins to each other in a, in a, in a humble way. Not like, ha, look what I got away with. But in a humble way saying, hey, I need help. I need help. We can't ignore the threats or we run back to protecting ourselves and our fleshly devices. We are part of the body of Christ and if we try to be a lone wolf or maybe I should say a lone sheep, we will end up being hunted. In Romans 15, starting with verse 1, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Jesus Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. We're a body of Christ. And and no one in the body should have to fight alone. When one member hurts, we are all hurt. There's ways to humbly confess our sins and weaknesses one to one, and weaknesses one to one, one to another. Satan hates it when sin and weaknesses get exposed to the fold, because then he has some ticked-off sheep with battle gear on protecting his potential victim. In prayer, in encouragement. You know, of course the sheep aren't without a shepherd either. Which brings us to the second landmark. Please, let's turn to Philippians 4.49. The second landmark is that they went to the Lord and they prayed. They prayed. Nothing takes God by surprise, but, but they reminded themselves of God's ways, power, and sovereignty by glorifying him and saying, God, this is what we've got. You take care of it. I, I love it when Hezekiah um, got this letter from the, the Syrian king. And the Syrian king says, we've conquered all these nations and their gods. Your God is no different. And we're going to conquer you. We're going to siege you. You're going to eat your own dung and all that stuff, just like the rest of them. And then Hezekiah took this letter and he opened it up before God and says, this is what they sent us. God knew it was written. But it was something that Hezekiah did. And guess what? The Assyrian king, pretty soon he finds out that his his men are dying and he goes back to his place and runs with his tail between his legs and Jerusalem is okay. And then not too much longer after that, that king that made all those threats was killed by his sons in his own palace. Bring it to the Lord in prayer. As the passage in Acts is an awesome example of prayer as these men recognize God's ways and align themselves with the will of God. You know, so many times when we pray, we try to get God to align himself with us, with our will. You know? God, here, here's, the, here's the plan. <laughs> right? Here, here's the plan. Okay, now make it happen. But that, that, that's, that's not what prayer is. You know, we've, 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 got, we've got two ears and one mouth. 
And so when we pray, that should be some of an indication of, of how we should pray. Listening. Twice as much as we're talking. Because what we really need to do is align our will with God's will when we pray. Peter, John, and his body of believers did not ask God for power to overthrow the religious rulers. They asked for power to overthrow the spiritual ruler with the power of God. They asked God to to be God, to be their God. You know, God doesn't operate in the context of the world and its bondage. He has a new and better way. In Philippians 4, starting with verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Align yourself. Pray, pray. Lord, what do I do now? And then, and then the Holy Spirit will remind you of the things that Jesus said. And getting into his word and reading his word is, is a way to get these things in your mind. Hide his word in your heart so that you will not sin against God. And the Holy Spirit reminds you, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the way we should walk in it. This is the way to line yourself up with me. And it's a way. It's daunting. It's, it's, it's freedom. It's unpredictable. You know, other than the plan we have written, we don't know the next day. But God does. And he's got his plan for us. And he cares for us. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. All your cares. If we pray for the power of God to accomplish his will, we will get what we are praying for. God has a distinct work he wants to do through us. And he will accomplish that will in us if we ask for it. When we pray, we must leave room for God to have his say. We have two ears, like I said, and one mouth. And that should be the ratio. Through the second landmark of prayer, we will be able to accomplish what only God can accomplish. When we rely on organization, we get what organizations can do. When we rely rely on education, we get what education can do. When we rely on eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. But when we rely on prayer, we get what God can do. Please, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 2. The third landmark in these disciples, they received power. They received exactly what they were asking for because that that is exactly what God had planned to give them. You know, so many hear the words of Paul and of Christ and they see meekness as weakness. The new way doesn't come with a familiar worldly power of politics, manipulation, anger, and unforgiveness. And I could go on and on with how the world tries to stay in control, to stay in, locked in, right? We always want to be locked into something. The threats that the disciples received were of this nature. They didn't succumb to these threats. No way. They were free in a way the world could not understand. Can we recognize God's power? It's not manipulative. It's not political. It's not self-serving. What's stronger? Okay? 
an angry outburst of rage that kills or the steadfast love that sacrifices and gives life. True power is not the ability to destroy or to take life. True power is the ability to give life. True power is truth. It is, it is love. It is sacrificial. You will receive power when you ask for it. In 1 Corinthians 2, starting with verse 1, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and am crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a de demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. Please, let's turn back to Acts 4, verse 32. You know, when, when, when they finished that prayer, that place shook. You know? Every once in a while, this place shakes too, and it's just because we got 50-mile-an-hour winds. But <laughs> that place shook with God's power. And through God's power, this group of believers were enabled to actions of boldness and community that accompanied by grace that was sure to change the world one person at a time. In Acts 4, 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was, was upon them all. That's freedom. That's power. And, and, and I see this church, the generosity of this church, the, the, the sharing, the, the compassion, the caring. That's power. And it's, it's not a power that we have of ourselves. It's a, it's a power that overcomes our weakness. I, I, I like that, that, that Paul was saying, hey, I came to you in much trembling. And I, I'll just say to you today, sometimes, almost every Sunday, I am shaking in my boots. It's scary up here. Isn't it, Raz? It's scary up here, isn't it? Sometimes. Mina. but it's powerful. How about you? Have you trusted in the bondage of your wealth, your power, and your comfort to be set free to a journey to the open plains or the open plans of God's riches, power, and grace? I'm going to rephrase that. Have you traded in the bondage of your wealth, your power, and your comfort to be set free to journey the open plans of God's richest power and grace? Are you free falling into the invisible arms of God's wonderful grace? Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today, and Lord, we thank you for being the God you are, perfect in any way, just and righteous and holy. But beyond that, love, your love. And even as, as it starts out with, with the Israelites going and being freed from the bondage in Egypt. Your description they gave of you is a God full of compassion, of mercy and loving kindness. And you're still that God. And you proved it. And, and you had that plan from the beginning of the world. Even as we read in Acts, from the beginning of time, you planned this grace was always there. 
and Jesus Christ was laid out from the beginning to the time he was crucified at just the right time. Lord, we look at your grace, we look at your love, we, we understand it in the name of Jesus Christ, and it is in this name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.